For anyone struggling with depression or thoughts of suicide, you aren't alone. Difficult to talk about uh, what we've been doing today and Tyler Holinsky passing away yesterday, dying by suicide uh, in, uh, in Pullman, Washington, 21 years old, parent gunshot wound, self-inflicted and uh, no, de- no more details uh, yet, Brock. I'm sure they'll come out uh, over the course of the next day or so. Apparently there was a suicide note left and haven't heard anything yet about that and you what know, can we learn? Yeah, what can we learn from it to, to hope that other people don't end up in the same spot that he unfortunately mm-hmm. found himself in yesterday? So, yeah, you're right when you when you say that this is something a lot of people can relate to. I mean, everybody has known somebody who has passed away. There are others who have known you know people related to suicide. For me, it was my roommate whose brother committed suicide uh, while we were living together after college. Uh, and it was it was horrible. I mean, just watching him and his family and his mom, and it, you know, it was it was devastating to watch what happened to their family. And Tyler's the middle. He's got an older brother who's a QB. He's got a younger brother that's a commit to Washington State as a is a is a quarterback being recruited. Yeah, you know, and two brothers and family and friends and loved ones, and teammates, and a program and athletic department. I mean, it's just the ripple effect of pain is just real. It is real, and you're just not going to. You're not going to escape it. No. 206-421-3776. Zach is in Puyallup. Good morning, Zach. Hey. uh, So, yeah. So I was in the Army for about seven and a half years and uh, watched, you know, watched some people kill themselves, you know, had some friends that went through it. Um, You know, I've been out for about a year and a half now. Uh, I've, you know, I've definitely had my share of struggles. Been told it's, you know, survivor's guilt and uh, all this other stuff. And something that, the army has that I know college has is they have the resources. They have all the resources, like what Brock was saying earlier about, you know, counseling and you're surrounded by all your friends. But the thing is, you know, me being in the military and him being a football player, you know, you, you think you're macho and you want to be macho and you don't want your friends to look at you as being weak or anything. Mm. So a lot of people don't say anything. They think they're okay. You know, they think they're just going through a little patch and then it gets to the point where, you don't know what they're going to do. You don't know what they're thinking. And then they do what they do. They leave people behind. They leave people wondering. And uh, so a lot of people just need to realize that people won't look at them as being weak if they need help. Because I still get help. Zach, help. I, I love this. You know? and, and thank you for calling in. Thank you for your service as well. But I, but I appreciate that point of yeah. view. It's something we've spent a lot of time talking about. How, how much harder do you think it is to, to seek? Have you sought, Have you sought help in the past? Oh, yes. Yeah I, yeah, I still go to the VA. I still, uh, you know, I'll go at times, and then, you know, at times I'll take a couple months off saying I'm fine, and then, uh, you know, it doesn't get bad or anything, but I just realize, you know, I need to keep going, especially mm-hmm. for, you know, for myself, for my two daughters. You know, I got to do it for them. Um, people need to find something. Like, they just need to find something to keep them going. Yeah. Zach, I appreciate um, I appreciate you know, your thoughts on it, this. It, it's, you know, but it's, if anyone's listening that's going through it, it's, you know, it's not easy. And you just need to find a way. And if you have friends, talk to them. If you have family, talk to them. You know, find a way to help. And if you're a friend that is noticing or a family member that is noticing someone going through it, talk to them. You know, find ways online to see what you can do to help someone that's struggling with this. And we appreciate because the phone call, man. A lot of people can't do it alone, and yeah, the, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Well, Zach. That, that's it's it's really well put, and it's such an important point, Brock. You know, we we generally talk about macho and and machismo and manliness. We we joke about it a lot on this show. And how many times have we had answered the questions your questions about your man cave and the man code? And mm-hmm. I always make fun of it because I think that stuff is dumb. Mm. And at the you know that's mostly in humor. But this is sort of the underlying purpose behind it, because that stuff is dumb. Being a man is not about separating yourself and being in your macho cave watching football. <laughs> I love watching football. You know where I like to watch it? Mostly with my family, with my kids around and your my basement. wife and everybody else. Yep. Yeah, there are times where I got to be quiet and go down to the basement and not the bother people. The roof's a little small for me. Everybody's but you understand. Yeah. Like, I, 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 yeah, I hate I that know. stuff. Yeah. And this is why. Because it leads to a culture where somebody feels uncomfortable getting help, yeah. where somebody who literally needs it, who who may die without it, 
feels uncomfortable asking for help because oh, it's not manly. Yeah, you know, can't that, ask for help. I'm right. a man cave. I'm a man phone. Like God, I just I think probably, that stuff's ridiculous. That probably is a little bit what Gay Marks was sweeting, to be honest. You know, it kind of smacks me right back in the face. Not that I was judging his quote at all. It's just we are in a con- it, it, so much conversation, right? We have to, we we talk more than ever before, but it's not enough. Mm. And especially with the young men and men to to be vulnerable, to actually be vulnerable, <laughs> and to be real and to be genuine in that way. It's, still very difficult to do. And I think there's a misconception that goes with people who have been depressed that it's a very selfish thing, mm. that suicide is very selfish. And yet the common theme of these people who are reaching out and that, I mean, I just talked to Chris on the phone. He didn't want to be on the air or anything, but all he wanted to do is call up and spread a message of love and positivity. And it's amazing how many people, even when they're struggling, mm. are still thinking about other people and yeah. what they're going through, even though if they're going through an immensely tough time. And so I find it to be almost the opposite. There's a lot of people who are completely selfless, even in these tough times. Let's talk to Jennifer Stuber, Dr. Jennifer Stuber. She is uh, really at the forefront of suicide prevention and research at the University of Washington. Takes a few minutes with us here uh, on the Venue Kings Hotline. Good morning. Uh, Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I wish it was under better circumstances, although I I can't, you know, be surprising to 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 have reached out to you to talk on a sports show unless this was the issue at hand. But, you know, when you heard yesterday about Tyler Holinsky, what was your reaction and and how do you react to cases like this in general? Thanks for asking for for some expertise on on issues such as this one. Um, I was frankly just devastated, um, as I am when I hear about suicides that happen, particularly amongst our young people and our veterans. And um, I mean, my response is, um, well, first, I just want people um, in Tyler's community, um, you know, at at WSU, on his team, his family, to understand um, that suicide loss is obviously very difficult because, you know, it happens out of the order of what we expect. It's often a lot of guilt and unanswered questions, but people to understand that, you know, people who, who die by suicide are in a lot of pain and they're not thinking rationally at the time of their death. Um, they're thinking the world would be better off without them, which of course is so far from the truth and obviously not the case here. Um, so I want people to understand that taking care of themselves at this time and reaching out for help, because oftentimes people are at higher risk. You know, people on Tyler's team and the WSU community are, are now at higher risk. And so truly for the university to take this on as a very serious issue, not just in the weeks ahead as we process this devastating loss, but longer term. I find myself as Mike and I are trying to have this conversation for two and a half hours. How do I process this? Well, I mean, I, I mean, first off, it is allowing yourself, giving yourself time to grieve and like really talking. I'm glad you're talking about it on your show. And I'm really glad that you're talking to your colleagues about it. Um, but it's but the, the key thing is then trying to under for a lot of people it's understanding what suicide loss is and isn't. And so for me, I lost my husband to suicide and I devoted my career to this. I'm really about taking action around it. But but first, it's about trying to understand that suicide loss is about, you know, that person being in this place that we, you, you might not even be able to imagine how terribly they felt, you know, unless you've been there and experienced that depression or that anxiety or that, and that pressure. Um, and so it's understanding that suicide is an irrational act in response to deep pain that often we can't even um, comprehend ourselves because we have, if we haven't experienced it. And try not to go to judgment about it, um, but looking forward about what eventually, about what more we can be doing. And I do believe our institutions of higher ed can be doing a lot more um, to support their students. We, and the time has called for that, frankly. You know, we've been giving out uh, the, the King County Suicide Prevention Hotline today. There's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 800 800- Two seven three eight two five five. What jumped out to me was was the text line, and and maybe you know more about it. Seven four one seven four one. It sounds to me like an incredibly important and valuable tool, uh, given the way young people communicate today. Absolutely, I'm so glad that this new resource has come come about to supplement the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And what people don't think people don't realize is those two resources, the number you gave and the texting 741741, those two resources are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And honestly, you can call if you're just, you don't have to be in crisis as in, you know, you're in the moment, you're about to kill yourself. No, this this is a resource that's intended to be used, you know, at any time. Even if you're a concerned friend with a question 
or a loved one with a question or, you know, a, a, or your person having suicidal thoughts, these, this is a support that is there. And the crisis text line is, is an increasingly an important resource because young people are so often using their phones and, um, or, or unwilling you know, to talk, I would think. I mean, I, you know, so many young people, talk, exactly. they, they, it, it's not natural to them to pick up a phone and call somebody. But if you could do it slightly more impersonally, at least to start with a text message, uh, seems incredibly valuable. And uh, in my view, an absolutely brilliant step forward. For, absolutely. For, for this, I couldn't agree more. Yep. I'm just trying to place myself, Mike, back into my college football program. Hmm. 27 years ago at the University of Washington and being around the Tony Coates and the Dane Lookers and the Jeff Johnsons and my roommates and the grind together and the workouts together and the games together and just all growing together and just trying to imagine and just trying to put ourselves in a spot there where one of our teammates mm. gets in a, in a position where he has that kind of pain. But I'll just give out this number one more time. Uh, it's a suicide prevention text line, 741 741 We'll be giving out the hotline to call throughout the day, but I just think that text line is such a great idea, especially for younger people who uh, who may just be uncomfortable or feel awkward making a voice call. Yeah, just text. 741-741. With the Tyler Holinsky and him no longer being with us, there are so much more pressure that our youth and children are under today than it was maybe back in my day. Why? Maybe social media, maybe a lot of things. But I do feel like there's a lot, a lot more pressure. In my experience of just being around the Seahawks for 15 years now, and there's many stories that I can talk about. There's one story that I feel comfortable talking about because this one particular player came on maybe two years ago, and he discussed it on the radio. You guys remember T.J. Duckett? <clears throat> remember T.J. Duckett used to play for the Seahawks running back? Remember T.J. Duckett came here with the Seahawks, and um, <clears throat> he was getting ready to, in, the, in the off season. T.J. Duckett and I, we hung out a lot. We had a bunch of fun together. He was so excited about look the upcoming season that was to come. He was ready to get after it and get busy. And all he kept talking about was, was the season that was upcoming. He went through training camp and got through training camp and just, just excited about the upcoming season. And then he got cut. He didn't make the team. And I remember talking to him throughout. I'm like, man, I can't believe you didn't make the team. He was like, man, I know. That's crazy. That's all right, though. That's all right. You know, I'm going to show the Seahawks. I'm going to show the Seahawks one day. They're going to see. I'm going to go on another team, and I'm going to really go to work. I'm going to get busy when I go on another team. When I play the Seahawks, it's going to be on then. T.J. Duckett never got picked up. No other football team ever picked up T.J. Duckett. So I would still talk to him, and then it would less and less and less. And then you guys know how things go. Time kind of just moves on. And then he told me years later what happened. He went back to Michigan. He kind of went back. Didn't get picked up from any teams. Money, you guys know money isn't guaranteed in the NFL. Sometimes you think you're invincible. You think the money's going to always keep coming in. You're missing a lifestyle. You're missing, more important, you're missing being around your brothers and the brotherhood. Just imagine every single day, if you're having a rough day, sometimes you can be around your brothers in the locker room and, and, and having that encouragement and having that keep going and, and that laughter. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Nobody's really screaming your name. Nobody's saying your name. Well, one evening, one evening, TJ told me, he gets up, he goes over, he, lived, he was in Lansing, Michigan, he goes over, close to Michigan State campus, brings a gun, and he was going to commit suicide. And as he's there, he decides the last minute, maybe I shouldn't do this and maybe I should try something. And so he challenged himself to go on a 40 days and 40 nights situation in which he would only drink water. He gave himself a challenge. And he, that challenge, he felt like, saved his life. Why do I share that story? I share that story because it's so often that sometimes we see people and we see individuals and we think that their life is so great. 
And we think that because maybe they are a certain status or they are in a certain financial bracket and they think, oh, life must be great. But I'm here to tell you that the T.J. Duckett story and there have been many other stories of professional athletes that I have known that have left the game and go through something that is so tough. And you don't even have to be a professional athlete. You could just be just a common, everyday person, and you probably could be going through something. And I, myself, have gone through some things. So, again, for those that are out there that are, 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 are going through some things and that are, 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 are suffering and don't want to talk about it, I really hope that you're able to get that help. And, again, I want to repeat the number, the Suicide Prevention Hotline, the 1-800-273-8255. I didn't know Tyler. I didn't know what he was going through. And I'll never presume to know. But whenever I see news like this, Bob, of somebody who's taken their own life, the first thing I always think of is that, wow, that could have been me. That could have been me because some years back, I actually came very close myself to doing something similar to that. And I'm not really sure how much of my own story I want to share because it's obviously uh, uncomfortable content. But I feel like there might be some person or persons out there who are listening right now who may need to hear it and who may feel better as a result of hearing it. So I'll just I'll share a little bit of it. And I'll start by saying that um, I've dealt with depression basically my entire life since I was a kid. Uh, right up through right now, not right the second, things seem to be okay. But um, when you're in the throes of that, and again, I don't know what Tyler Holinsky was going through. I don't know if he was depressed. I don't know what happened there. But uh, just to get the message out there, if you feel like you're somebody who's dealing with depression, get help. Get help now because help is available and this problem is absolutely, absolutely manageable. It's not something that you have to be stuck in. And I realize that when you are in it, it's something that you may not even realize. That was my biggest problem when I was going through, my, I'd say, my worst bout of depression 15 years ago. I would say that I was so depressed that I didn't even realize what was going on. I just kind of became used to it after a while. Mm -hmm. Um and so when you, just, when you just accept that that's your life, it's hard to go out there and ask for help, especially if nobody around you knows what's going on. And I would bet that in nine out of 10 cases where somebody actually takes their own life, the people who are, who are surrounding this person probably had no idea what was going on. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing for anybody that's been around it. Yeah. Whether you were somebody who was going through it personally or people around you, close to you. You know, as you as you talked about, you you sort of got used to feeling that way. Yeah. You probably the, your outward appearance, your your face, your, your your demeanor probably didn't tip anybody off. People become very adept at hiding it, and and you know putting on the brave face and smiling and laughing, and then and then when something like that happens, everybody's caught off guard with whoa, they seem so happy. And I just talked to him or her the other day. I had no idea. You, you become very very adept at hiding that. So you never know what anybody's going through. You've got no idea, regardless of how jovial they seem or how fun they seem or whatever. You really have no idea what anybody's dealing with. Nope. And sometimes the more jovial they seem, the worse the problem actually is. I think they call that tears of a clown, right? You've heard that phrase sure. before. It's when you know, you're, you're outwardly very happy, but you're hurting on the inside. I think sometimes the, the happier somebody seems, the more upset they may actually be. And you know, I saw a tweet from Gabe Marks last night. I'll just read it to you because I thought he put it pretty well. He said, all the programs around the country need to start listening to these 19 and 21-year-old kids when they're going through things. We've made a culture that makes it taboo for young men to talk openly about their feelings and what they're going through. That's the conversation we need. I think that that's very true, and I think it's as true today as it was 20 years ago. I think we've gotten much better about it, but just think about how hard... That seems for a young man, especially to go up to somebody else and say, hey, I think I'm depressed. I need help. Mm -hmm. Just saying those words to yourself 
at times can be an impossibility, right? It, much because less it's perceived go- as a sign of weakness. Right, and who wants to come off as weak? Yep. We go through our entire lives trying to impress everybody else, trying to make money, trying to appear strong, trying to do all these sorts of things. The last thing we want to do is admit to somebody else that there's a problem, especially when it's something you can't see. It's one thing when you break your leg, right, or you break your hand or something. It's like, hey, I have a problem. I have to sit this one out. Right. But when there's something that's going on inside your head that we can't actually see, it's left up for debate. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, you know what? Suck it up. Get back out there. Mm-hmm. You know, you're coming into work today. I don't care how you feel. Yep. Well, there's something going on with me, and I can't, re- you know, I can't prove it to you, but there's something going on. That's a very, very difficult thing to try and explain to somebody else. But you should not be ashamed if that's the case. You absolutely should not be ashamed if that's the case because there are so many outlets out there that are available to you to get help. There are, there are places you can go. There are numbers you can call. In fact, I've got one uh, right here, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. I called one of those things once. I remember it was early 2005. I was having some problems with, um, with I'll just say it, with alcohol abuse back then, really bad problems. And I remember late at night one night, I actually pulled out the phone book, which when I was still using it, and I called one of those lines, and I sat there, and I talked to somebody for about a half an hour. And I think that was it, it helped. helpful? Well, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I don't really remember what I said. It mm-hmm. was so long ago, and I was drunk. But it, it helped in the moment, and in the moment was good enough. Yeah, because it leads to another moment. It gives you another moment. It gives you a beat to think. Maybe it gives you a beat to sober up. It gives you a beat just to take a breath. That's exactly right. And, and it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be the cure right there. But. I don't know if you get cured. I, I think. You, you you fight for it. Yeah. Right? You fight for that next moment. You fight for a reason for that next day. Let's not man up. Let's not tough it out. Let's find true strength instead. Show our vulnerability. Stop faking macho BS. Let's change. That's exactly that's, it. I mean, that's it to a point. I think that's part of the problem is, especially if you're in football or you're in, you're in something that's considered gladiator, macho sport or or industry, what have you. It doesn't mean you're a construction worker. You're the You're supposed to be impervious you're not supposed to feel of course and you're certainly not supposed to ask for help yeah yeah i mean there's there's physical weakness yeah i broke my arm man snapped my leg there's almost some sort of nobility in that right if you get hurt in this gladiator sport but there's there's no you know the perception is there's no nobility and hey man i'm going through something mentally here that's breaking me down yeah i mean i'll give you an example zach Greinke was a guy that remember he was out of baseball for a little while there because he saw it treatment for uh, things like panic, anxiety, depression, etc. And I remember being in this business after he came back and hearing chatter, whether it was amongst the hosts or amongst baseball people, people labeling him as a head case. Oh, do you really want Zach Granke? I mean, yeah, he's a good pitcher and he's talented and everything, but he's a head case. I mean, that's the kind of mentality we're dealing with here. He's not a head case. He's a guy who had a problem who went and did the right thing and sought treatment for it. You know what? Now he's one of the best pitchers in baseball yeah. and has been ever really ever since he's come back. So that is always, always the right decision. So I guess as we talk through this today, um, my message is that it gets better. It won't always be better, but it gets better if you want the help and you seek it out. It, it absolutely can be better. You don't have to go through what you're going. You know what I did, Bob, when I was going through this at my worst point? I never got out of bed for like maybe, well, I'll say I never got out of bed, but I barely got out of bed for a couple of months. You know what I did all day? I listened to Sports Talk Radio. This is before I was ever in the business. This might be actually the reason why I got into it. That's mm-hmm. how I discovered it. Was it. cathartic? Yeah, well, I don't know. I just, I needed something to do during the day. And I'd wake up, I'd be depressed, I'd lay there and I'd say, man, what am I going to do? I don't even know what the heck I'm going to do today. I would just stream Sports Talk Radio. And at some point, I said, you know what, I think I can do that. Mm-hmm. I think I could do that. And as I sort of um, worked my way out of this problem, that's exactly what I did. I set a goal and I accomplished it. And, uh, you know, look at where I am today. So in a way, thank you, sports radio. But it was just I'm picturing somebody out there right now who is going through the exact same thing that I was years back. Yeah, and, it's, and my, it's, it's not unique, not to minimize what no, you of course or anybody. Not. It's, it's pr- really prevalent. It's, is too, my it's point. too prevalent. So, so as much as it's a secret, people aren't that vocal about it. 
people try to hide it. They go to great lengths to hide it. We, we have no idea. I don't want to make any, any assumptions about what he was going through or what he was responding to or what led him to this point. I've, we've got no idea. None. So I don't want to talk about, well, there's the pressures of, you know, social social uh, media. You never know, you know, the bullying on there and things could have gotten to it. We, we have no We idea. don't know with him, no but idea. I mean, but how many how many stories have we heard out there, even with kids who are younger than him, right, who have been bullied on social media sure. and they end up, as a result, tragically taking their own lives? I mean, we know that that's a problem that exists out there. So I guess, you know what, the first thing I'll say about that is if you're a person who's not depressed, be nice to everybody else. And I, I'm not saying that in a glib way. I really mean it. You don't know what anybody else is going through. So no. be nice to everybody else. To, to borrow a phrase from Doug Baldwin, empathy. Mm -hmm. Use it. Yep. Right? D if, if you feel like uh, you may be getting into a situation where you're getting on somebody's case or you're making them feel bad, hurting their feelings, you probably are. So stop. Stop right there. I mean, treat everybody with respect. That, that's the first thing. Because we don't want, we, we don't know what the uh, origins of these problems are, but often it's from things like bullying, especially for younger kids. So let's stop that first, and then we can treat these other problems. When you're when you're in that state of mind, Bob, look, like you just said, most people who don't have this problem, your goal is to stay alive, right? You, you, preserving your own life is your number one priority, and you'll do. Things like keeping yourself in shape, eating right, keeping yourself out of high-risk situations, etc. When you're in this state of mind, this depressed state of mind, preserving your own life is not a priority, and you start to lose sight of that. That's when things start getting difficult. That's when things start getting dangerous, mm -hmm. when, you're, when, you, when your biggest priority isn't your own health. And as soon as, if you're somebody out there who, is, who feels like that has begun to happen to you, again, tell somebody. Call somebody. Call anybody. Help. Tweet me. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll take that call. I've taken them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as have I. It's it's a it's a it's a hard spot to be in, on either end of that. Right. Yes. To be the guy that's reaching for help. To be the guy that's being reached out to. But it's again, it it, it is it's such a hard topic. It's such a hard thing to deal with. And for a young kid like that, I mean, it doesn't really matter what age you are if, if this sort of things ha or if this sort of thing happens. Because God knows what you are going through, whether you're 70 years old or whether you're 21. But certainly a life that is yet to be lived. When you're 20, you haven't experienced anything yet. This kid didn't get to experience his life at all. That's a tragedy. That's it's, a tragedy. It's brutal. It's brutal. And, and, and again, I, I was thinking of, of his family and his friends and those close to him. And, and, you know, like I said, I've experienced it and been around the people that felt the guilt. How come we didn't do this? I could have done this. I could have done that. You know, for somebody like Holinsky, where it seems like this came out of nowhere, and I don't, you know, again, maybe the, we'll hear more about, you know, yeah, he seemed down, or people, he had a history of this, that. We've got no idea. But when it comes out of nowhere, the expectation that you should have known on any level, or you should have done more, you're not being fair to yourself. You know, and that's... And you have a right to feel that way sure, today. it makes sense. If you've been around but, somebody who's ever done this, uh, who's ever taken their own life... It leaves you with nothing but un unanswered questions, many of which may remain unanswered forever. But at the same time, it's important to know, like you just said, what they were going through wasn't what you were going through. Yeah, and 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 you you do your best with what you got. You do your best as a friend, as a, as a wife, a husband, a brother, a sister, daughter, son, what whatever. You do your best with what you've got, the knowledge you've got, and sometimes you you don't have control. You can't control the situation, especially. Like I said, in my case, where it was a very slow situation, where we just watched and we just, this person was—that was it, man. Mm -hmm. Their mind was made up. There was no, there was no talking them out of it. There was no, there was nothing left to say. You know what I mean? It was just somebody who just had committed themselves to. I don't want to be here. This, this doesn't work for me anymore. And this is the path I've chosen. And I, I appreciate what you're saying to me, but it, this, this is how it's it, going to go for me. And that's a shame when it's such a slow decline like that. I'll say this. In my experience, Bob, when I did finally reach out for help and I got this problem, I at least arrested the problem. I don't know if there's any cure, but you can arrest the problem. What I found is that there were just there were so many more people out there who were like me than I ever thought. Because oh, yeah. the, the one thing you feel when you're depressed is you feel lonely. You feel like you're alone and you're in this pit of despair and you're the only one who's going through it and everybody else is fine. And that's just not the case. The more you open yourself up and you talk to other people, the more that you the comfort you're going to find in common experience. That's important. 
That's well, something you can build on if you have this problem, this common experience. Share your story with other people. You will feel better. I'm trying to digest the impact of the loss of Tyler Holinsky, who was a 21-year-old quarterback. He was a redshirt sophomore, had started the Cougars' bowl game, and found dead yesterday of what police say is a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And I know for me, there's there's nothing that really takes your breath away quite like knowing that someone so young, so full of promise, and seemingly having so much going for them reached that point that they did that. And my first reaction is always to think I feel so badly for his family, for his friends, for everyone who's on that team, and really for all Cougs. Um, that 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 they've lost that person that's there, and and then I also feel really really sadly for him that he reached that point that he felt so terrible about that. Uh, really, just a difficult thing. We don't spend much time sort of focusing on the, the really serious important things in life. We talk about sports, and when when one of those moments hits it like this, you realize that that it is there tragedy can intrude into the sports world that's really really tough news yeah and it's it's also kind of a reminder of uh no matter what somebody looks like and how they're behaving and that there could be that thought going through their minds because i'm just looking at his his career and he went to notre dame high school and sherman oaks and you know was a was a great player he got in had a couple of uh appearances this year, and it just, and I, I'm guessing that you're going to hear from his teammates that, you know, they they didn't see this coming, and you know, and that's the thing about it. I, the only experience I had kind of firsthand with this was uh, played with a, or I actually worked with a guy at Merrill Lynch uh, down in Arizona named Mark Walzak, and he was a tight end and a long snapper in the league for a while. But one of his best buddies was Junior Seau, and he had been with Junior Seau the weekend before. I think it was a Tuesday that Junior took his life, and uh, he had been with him the entire weekend. And, you know, he said, look, like at the end of the – you know, he dropped him off at the airport. He said, love you, bro. And, you know, they had a great time together. Just didn't see it coming. Just didn't see any of that. So that's that's the thing that, like you, like you said, Danny, it just, just kind of takes your breath away. Yeah, when, when, uh, when I heard the news last night, I was with my daughter uh, in Issaquah, and I just, uh, y- you can't believe it. I mean, it's just, y- you still can't believe it. You look at this kid, just outward looking in, and you see what he did this year. Uh, the, the game against Boise State, uh, the game against Arizona where he came in and threw for more than 500 yards, starting for Luke Falk in the Holiday Bowl. And, and doing a good job. And, and then you, you, you think, okay, he's going to be the starting quarterback next year. Luke Falk is graduating. And, uh, yeah, you just wonder. You go, okay, uh, on the outside again, looking in, you think, man, this kid had everything going for him, but something was, was troubling him. And, um, I, I just, and then after all those things raced through your mind, and some of the tributes from players and different people around the country were, were nice to read, but I immediately thought about the parents. And I just, you know, as a, as a parent myself, you just think, oh, my God, if your kid, you know, and, and then having to live with that and trying to figure out what, what happened, what you could have done, and reading the story from uh, Theo Lawson and the Spokesman Review that was really well done after the Boise State game and uh, talking about his mom, walking his mom back to the Marriott after the game and, and how happy they were. And then Theo also talked to the dad and the brother. The younger brother is, has been offered a scholarship and is a quarterback uh, he's been offered a scholarship from Washington State, but then just to just to read about the dad and the brother and how excited they were when Tyler came in for Falk and the Boise State game, and then leading him, leading us to the 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 win in triple overtime, and just all these things racing through your mind, and and um, you know thinking about what it's like in Pullman today, and seeing the where where Butch the statue is and the memorial there where flowers and hats uh, cougar flags and it's just it just it sucks man it's just it's it's a sad day for especially I mean not only the Cougs but I mean just especially the Helensky family we don't talk about suicide a lot in 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 the country and it's one of the things I know when I worked at a newspaper you don't really cover suicide and there's a reason for it because they, you don't want to provide attention to it because that might actually lead more people to do that. One of the undersides, one of the drawbacks of not discussing it is that 
sometimes you don't know when someone's feeling that way and you don't, there's, there's, whether it's a shame or a stigma that can be about it. Um, I, I've suffered from depression. I, I really, my entire adult life, like I've been di- diagnosed with it for 15 years. And that's not to say I have no idea what Tyler Holinsky was going through, but I do know that feeling where everything around you feels awful. And I've never gotten to the point where I felt like harming myself or anything like that, but you can get into a really negative space. And if there's one thing that, that people need to know is that you need to reach out to people around you if you're feeling that way. Um, we, we've been mentioning the, the hotlines. There's a, a national suicide hotline that's manned 24 hours a day, 800-273-8255. You can also text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741. And... One of the things, and Gabe Marks made this point in a, in a tweet last night, was that people need to be aware that those sort of mental health issues, that if you're feeling that way, it can get better. It's not as bad as it feels. And that's coming from someone who has felt really bad before. And talking about it and reaching out to people, it helps. You do get better. I've taken medication for depression for now 10 years, and, and my life's better. Like I, I, I'm better at dealing with that. And if there's a stigma or anything attached to those sort of mental health concerns, I don't feel it. I, I'm a better person for and better at understanding what's going on with me because I reached out. And so if there's one thing that it can come out of this, because I, I had one friend and he was touched. He had someone that was close to him. He's one of my best friends, but he had someone that was close to him who committed suicide. And he came out and he said, you know, it's the most selfish thing you can do. And I, I understand why people would say that. The, the one way I think it's misguided, though, is because you don't really understand how that person who feels that way, just how all-powerful that feeling of sadness is. And the key to breaking out of that is not to burrow into your own cocoon. It's to reach out and talk to somebody. And, and it, it really is, and it's that simple, and it gets better. If there's there's talking about it and working through those things. There is nothing that's happening. I have no idea what factors combine to make Tyler Holinsky feel that way. And actually, I'm not even all that interested in knowing that. Whatever he made him feel that powerfully sad in its own way was that that was what he was dealing with. And the key to getting out of those is realizing there's nothing that's so bad that you can't come back from it. And suicide is the thing that makes it there's there's no there's no rebounding from that. I agree with you, Jim. I feel terrible for his family. It's there's there's any people around him would do anything to be able to reach out and get in touch with him to prevent this from well, happening. Well, and, and you and Danny, you're right. You you don't know. And I and I still I, I can still remember, you know, hearing the first time you told me that you you had you've dealt with depression. And I remember being surprised because you're usually jovial, upbeat, and, and I, I, I was surprised to hear that. And Dave, the same thing with you. You know, we've, we've all dealt with it, and, and I, I've dealt with it. And I, I, I've told the story before about being over in my mom's cabin when I was, you know, in between relationships. A girlfriend broke up with me. I didn't even know if I wanted to be with her, and yet I was so depressed I couldn't even, I couldn't get out of bed for, to, to make coffee I, I, I cry. I remember I, I cried for 30 days straight and I thought, you know, OK, I'm going to I'm going to start. I'm going to try and go one day without crying. And it was like quarter to midnight. And I thought, OK, I'm going to make it. And then I didn't. I didn't make it. And, and I can still remember. I thought, well, I'll go golfing and I'll feel better if I go golfing. I was out at McCormick Woods. I'm on the seventh hole and I start crying. It's depression is just something. And, and I would literally tell myself, you know, you have nothing to be depressed about. You have a good life. You're a sports writer at the P.I. You've got a great daughter. Uh, you know, I was in between relationships, but it was just hard to explain. I knew I was messed up, but I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. I just couldn't get out of it. And so the only thing about that that I'm glad, I'm glad that it happened. So I have a, an a, a pre, a, appreciation isn't the word, but at least I have the knowledge, I, I guess, of what it's like to get into a dark place. Now, I never, just like you, I never felt like harming myself, but uh, I, I, I have a, a better understanding, I guess, when someone does get depressed when you on the surface you think well th- that person shouldn't be depressed and and because i felt the same way I, sh- I i shouldn't feel that way and yet i did you know i think it's something we need to force ourselves to talk about because i'll, I'll be honest with you i'm i'm being forced right now to talk mm-hmm. about it because i, d- I didn't want to and I, I think that that's how you get 
you know, that's how you progress is that you do need to force yourself to talk about it. So, you know, and I'm, my email response is like, I really don't have anything to say, but I think that that's, you know, you, you mentioned Danny, the stigma about it and talking about it and that needs to change. That needs to change. And, uh, you know, maybe if, um, there's any purpose, uh, going forward, uh, with Tyler Helensky and, and him taking his life, it's, it's that. So I, I think that that's one of those things that, you know, it's like a, a something that you kind of kept in the dark and we're seeing a lot of things starting to come to the light, Mm -hmm. right? And we're starting to see some of these things that people didn't talk about uh, years ago, you know, even within our lives, uh, you know, it was whether, you know, all these different, different things that aren't the norm or they're not usual. You, I just think we need to be forced to talk about it. And then the more it's out there, then the more likely people are to get help, right? I mean, then you don't think that, you know, you're strange or different or anything like that. And, uh, and I think that's the one good thing that, that can come out of this. And, and I'm glad I'm being forced to talk about it because the more we, we sit here and, and, and talk about it, the more you think, you know, gosh, it's, it's too bad that, you know, maybe 20 years from now, it won't be something that, you know, uh, happens because people feel strange talking about it. Yeah, it's a really difficult it's a really difficult sort of thing to describe, but what Jim mentioned, kind of the empathy you feel when you've gone through it of understanding how someone can be in a really negative, where they just look around and think everything around them is completely irrevocably messed up. And that sort of darkness and that weight that's there and the question of how do you get over that? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but it all starts with reaching out to the people. I think one of the reasons that I really like this job it's not just because I really like working with you guys and with Jess and Curtis. It's and it's it's not even just that I like talking to people, but we're all kind of part of the same community. And even something like this with Tyler Holinsky, that he's a part of the community too. He's kind of bonded together by this web of sports fans, people that are interested in sports. And look, I'm a Husky, but I really, I, I in my own way, really love the Cougs, and I feel terrible that their community is affected by this and to remember that we are we're, con- we're all in this together in in many different ways and reaching out and t- and talking to people is a really good thing there's nothing bad that comes out from just kind of taking a moment to think and you don't know what another person's going through and maybe an extra smile will be something and if you're feeling bad maybe you make that extra smile to someone else and that's your first step to going back it, it all does come back you get better by interacting with people. And whether it's calling a hotline to talk to someone because you're feeling especially desperate or whether it's just kind of making some steps, the, the key to feeling better, I think, in almost all situations is, is by opening yourself up and, and having interactions and support from the people around you because people are, are, are there for that. Yeah, it's uh, when you're in it, though, and again, uh, I have no idea what Tyler Helinski was going through, and I, I can just uh, speak from personal experience, but when I was going through it, it you know, people would tell you that it's going to get better, and you kept hearing that, and you didn't really feel like that was true. And then once you do get to the other side, you, you go, well, okay, it is true, but it, it, it's a rough one. It's really, when you're going through it, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I, I, I drank a lot to try and get through it. And, and then I got onto antidepressants and they told me if I, if I drank that it would counter, counter the effect of the drug. And so I was torn on what to do then. And uh, it's just, God. I just, hesitate to ask, which way did you choose? Well, I, I pretty much went with the booze. <laughs> So, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that again, I'm, I, I, I'm glad in a weird way that I went through that because I never understood, you know, before that it was like, what do you have to be depressed about? You know, well, what's the matter with you? Why can't you shake yourself out of it? Why can't you just pull yourself out of it? Well, it's not that simple. Yeah. And it doesn't help to have somebody sit there and list your assets no. of why you shouldn't be right. So, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, you know, and I was thinking you were talking about the bonding thing and maybe with this team too, it'll bring this team closer together, you know, mm-hmm. this, this Cougar team, and then maybe it'll positively, 
positively affect uh, kids going forward that are part of that or that are touched by this. So just really sad again. Yeah, I want to also being a parent, it's just, uh, I just can't imagine what his family's going through. And that's, that's the part of it that really hit me and why I had to be forced to talk about this. Well, and the stories too, from his teammates, uh, a couple of them today when I saw him now, Peyton Bender doesn't play at Washington state anymore. I think he transferred to, to Kansas maybe, but he had something on Instagram where he just talked about, you know, how much, you know, and spoke to Tyler directly and how much he appreciated him as a friend and how he wishes he could, you know, go and buy Sour Patch Kids and watch The Office with him again, you know, just one more time. And then Parker Henry had a story, too, about, I uh, told you a lot about Tyler Holinsky, just in what Parker Henry had to say about that, that Parker was uh, coaching some six-year-olds playing t-ball, and he did it for credit. Uh, there at WSU and that Tyler wanted to help out just because he loves kids and sports and just wanted to help out, but he wasn't getting any credit for it. So it just sounds like he was a terrific kid. And uh, man, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's just so hard to believe. 21 years old, 21 years old. Feel really bad for his family. Our thoughts and prayers with them and, and hope people feel better. If you have a second, make sure the people around you know that they're loved. And if you're feeling lonely, you need to know that you are loved as well. For anyone struggling with depression or thoughts of suicide, you aren't alone. Share your struggle with family and friends. Help is always waiting. Call the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit crisisclinic.org. 